and I'll welcome everyone to the second installment of the Health Sciences Workshop Series, which is focused today on how to make your research open and accessible. For those of you who didn't attend yesterday, my name is Kevin Reed, and I'm a health sciences librarian here at the university. And a lot of my research focuses on research data management, as well as open scholarship. So the idea of making all the products of your research open and accessible. And that's really what we're going to focus on today. Um, how you, if you're interested in doing so, can make different aspects of your research open. Now, this is something that's a little bit different than what we've experienced before, in the sense that openness or accessibility isn't necessarily a requirement. So I think there are arguments to be made why you might want to make something open or not. And that's what we're going to try to cover today. So I always start this session with a question, or two questions for that matter. And the first is, when you hear the word open, what, is, what, is, what word association do you have with that? So when you think of openness or open, what, what comes to mind? And if you're willing to share in the chat, please post that now. Honest. Oh, interesting. Okay, I haven't heard that before, but I, I like that a lot, actually. Asmahan, thank you for sharing that. Accessible to everyone. Absolutely. Thanks, Karen. Understandable. Okay. I like that too. Transparency, ethical research without subscription. Yes. Thank you, Sai. I appreciate that very much. We'll be talking a lot about those types of things today. So excellent. So what if I flip the question and I ask you, what are you what do you associate when you hear the word closed? What comes to mind? It is all mine, yes. <laughs> if it is closed, I suppose anything that you create would be all yours. That's right. Pay to access, okay. Anyone else? Okay. If you have other ideas, please feel free to share them. Not good enough for everyone to see it. Oh, interesting, Michelle. I like that take. I think there are justifications for why maybe something of your research maybe isn't in a state where you feel comfortable sharing it yet. So yes, they're absolutely not accessible. So, so let's focus today on what we're really going to be talking about. And what I want to stress is we're going to be able to articulate the difference between what a closed research process looks like and what an open research process looks like. We're going to define open scholarship you're going to be able to define or outline how open scholarship fits into the different stages of the life cycle to identify some current open initiatives and how you can apply best practices in open scholarship. So the term open scholarship is really a broad umbrella term for a lot of different initiatives or, or, or ethoses around openness and research. And so this might relate to equitable access to information, it might relate to citizen science, so actual participants practicing in research, open source tools, um, open education. And today, what we're really going to focus on is the idea of open research or open science itself. Um, open science is the more common term, but we want to be inclusive of all of these different categories. And so what we're thinking about here really is how do we open up our research across the board, not just at the very end of our project? So similar to those of you who attended yesterday, I always start with the research life cycle because it helps us conceptualize the different stages we go through as we work through our own research projects. And so again, at the idea stage, we're creating a research question. Maybe we're reviewing existing research and we're developing a hypothesis. We're then creating instruments or planning experiments or identifying participants or recruiting participants to be in a study. We're then collecting data from those participants. We're gathering text and numbers and we're storing data and we're describing it. We're analyzing it. We're using software. We're describing that process and preparing our data to be shared in a publication or at a conference or with other research projects. And so whereas for those of you who attended yesterday, where the data management or research data management is solely about transparency, right? Helping people understand what it is we did at every stage of our research process. What open scholarship is focused on is accessibility. So not only 
am I describing to you how I built my methods and what my study protocol is? I'm actually sharing all of those things as I work through the process. So this might make you excited as an opportunity to share your research, or it might scare you. And that's okay. Um, I think open science and open scholarship generally is a challenging thing to come around. But what I'm going to try to do here is explain to you why it's important and why we are seeing a change in how research is being done more broadly. So let's take a look at what current research practices look like in a nutshell. So the closed research process is essentially, we do all our work behind the scenes, we get that work done, and then we communicate it and write up a paper and we publish that paper. But what all of the underlying factors that go into that publication, all the different instruments we build or the documentation we build might not necessarily be visible. You might see elements or snippets of the methods of data collection or how you've done analysis, but you're not actually getting to see the meat, the actual content or the stuff that you worked with. And so referring back to that iceberg slide again from yesterday from the data management class, the publication is that tip and all the other pieces of information are technically or usually not included to the degree of which you'd be able to understand or work with those products on your own. And so closed research arguably is the idea that we're actually hiding a lot of the research process behind the scenes and that the manuscript, while oftentimes sufficient to provide enough information to help us with a research project, doesn't really get to all the different facets or pieces of, of, of value research outputs that we might use. And so really what, what's happening with closed research is it's closing itself off. This also becomes increasingly a problem when it gets to the idea of subscription publishing. So when it comes to me actually publishing my research, if I published in a closed journal, ultimately I have to pay for it or other people have to pay for it to access it. And so whether it's a university or a granting agency paying a faculty member or a grad student to do their research, the faculty gives away their rights to a publisher for free, and then ultimately the library or you or anyone who wants to access your article has to pay for it to gain access. And so when we think about the subscription model and closed research, it's only actually providing access to your research to a very small subset of people who can afford to do so. So when we combine that with the fact that we also can't access any of the methods or the approaches that you used on top of that manuscript, we're really restricting a huge amount of research from people in terms of us being able to share that and people being able to use it for research um, more broadly. So why is that problematic? Well, first, it's closed research hides key components of the research process. It also considers other products of research less valuable. So if you spend a year building an amazing survey or data collection instrument that you think could be applicable to many people, why couldn't you share that as well and have it cited so that other people can use that for their own research? It also makes reproducing results more difficult. Obviously, if we can't access it, it's very hard for us to be able to reuse it. It restricts access to research, especially for people who, again, don't have the financial means to access it. It also means that journals focus on the most eye-catching results. So for ones that are paid, journals are only going to acquire the things that are the flashiest or the highest interest. And so research that might be really valuable, but that doesn't have that necessary appeal might get pushed to the back of the line. And ultimately, what this comes down to is that it's starting to eliminate and erode trust in research, because if we can't reproduce results and we can't access these different research outputs, how do we know that what's being done is trustworthy and been done correctly? And so why has research been closed for so long? The incentives to promote the publication of all else, right? So if you want to get tenure or you're looking to get a new job, or, or basically um, trying to apply for grants, the publication is that sole evaluating factor and has been forever, which is really um, restricting what kinds of research can be used. It also creates competition. So you don't want to open your research because someone else might use it and get credit for it. Also, journals and publishers make more money this way, so they're going to perpetuate the model. And if you attend Dee Dee Dawson's talk tomorrow on open access publishing, She's going to help you identify ways for you to reduce the price of what you pay and where to look for research more openly. And then generally for authors and for yourself, this gets to something that Michelle had brought up in the chat. It's harder to make your research transparent. 
if every aspect yeah, it makes it requires you to say every instrument or every piece of information you create is good enough to be shared and accessed by others so there's many reasons and factors both good and bad as to why research has been closed for a very long time so what we're seeing a lot in research now is that we're seeing a transition to an open scholarship model. And so what I wanna do is clarify what I mean by open scholarship here. And open scholarship basically was founded a little less than 10 years ago. And the idea is that in order for you or open scholarship to be possible, you need to make the products of your research that's publicly funded. So I wanna stress that it's publicly funded research should be accessible with no or minimal restriction. It should foster sharing and collaboration as early as possible in the research process and create a systemic change in the way research is done. So ideally, open scholarship is the idea that we open up all of these pieces of information on this slide, our research question, our instruments, all of that is shared openly and we can get credit for it so that we can become a more collaborative and open environment. The same goes for that iceberg model. The idea is we're not just limited to the publication, we're looking at everything in here that's available and possible. So what are the main benefits of this? It improves the quality, integrity, and transparency of research. It allows you and anyone to access other types of research products potentially for free. It encourages collaboration, and it creates an opportunity also for you to get feedback at all stages of your research. So it's not just at the peer-reviewed stage anymore. You can share this information with your colleagues or your peers and say, what do you think of this approach? And research becomes more collaborative and open that way. And it also creates a stronger engagement with the public because now we're making things open and we might be thinking about who the actual participants or um, people who might be impacted by our research would be affected by and could read. So when we think about open scholarship, we wanna be as transparent as possible across all the different stages of the research process. This also comes to the point where we get to publication and the idea of the open access model. So in this case, right, the funder or institution would pay you, the researcher, you would publish in an open access journal. It would be peer reviewed. Sometimes journals offer or require fees, other times they don't. And that article is published and it's free to everybody. And so from the open science or open scholarship model, our research published is open everywhere. And we know that this already has a lot of advantages for us. So one is that open access articles, if you publish in an open access journal, receives 18% more citations than the average subscription article. And this makes sense, right? If your research is open and free, anybody can access it and therefore they can use it for their own research and inform their own work, giving you credit for it. If your research is closed, only a smaller percentage of people can access it and therefore they can't use it. So before I move on to what it looks like in action, are there any questions or comments people have so far about the idea of openness versus closed and some of the challenges or benefits to doing this all? Okay. I see a hand up. Like, sorry, I can't see who it is. Oh, Grace. It's Grace, yeah. Hi. Thanks very much, Kevin, for yeah, the conversation so far. Um, the one question that really comes to me when openness of uh, research is very good, but one thing that normally comes up to me um, is the ability to, um, while you're being open, um, getting people that probably do not understand where you're coming from in terms of your research, to criticize it. Okay, right. um, um, I know uh, I had some some time ago, someone wrote a research was on realist evaluation. A realist mm -hmm. evaluation is very pretty much new. It's not very popular. And uh, he had to apply for a grant um, and the, the grant was declined. Uh, and, and the comment from the grant reviewer, you can tell that they don't really understand what the realist evaluation was all about. And so, and that is applying for a grant. So I'm much more when you do the publication. And so right. um, some people can tend to easily criticize not knowing where you're coming from and your context, and probably even write a letter to the editor and say your result is not worth, uh, you know, what's right. 
publishing. So some people probably will have that kind of fear and they're not open to having their open publication. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's You raise a really good point, Grace. And I think that is one of the fears is that, again, it's that idea of, of the competitiveness that's being bred in through specifically this type of work. And so when someone does share something openly, it does open it to criticism, which causes a lot of fear. And I think depending on the discipline, we're seeing a lot of it being open and positive in some areas and not in others. And so I think doing this on your own is one thing, but a culture change is another huge impact here. And I see the questions about um, from both Farzana and Asmahan about how do you balance risk of knowledge theft with open research and get credit through the process. And I'm, I am going to talk about how there are tools you can use to share things and make sure that it's citable. So I'm, I'm going to, to share that as well. So thank you for, for bringing that up. So let's just talk a little bit, and this gets to a bit to Grace's point about what it looks like in action, right? And I think the easiest example of where we saw open research be a positive thing was with COVID-19 and the idea that everybody started sharing everything, um, data, preprints, uh, instruments, protocols, all of that was done obviously around a very momentous world event. And we saw people sort of break down those barriers and how quickly you could come to an outcome for something based on that process. But we also know that this there was a huge issue on the other side, right? So we know that Moderna, for example, wouldn't release a lot of their information to developing countries. And therefore, again, research remained closed and inaccessible to a large amount of people. So we see a dichotomy here of people trying to make change and working to do so and having a positive effect, but still those closed parameters fitting into this where we have the big companies who make the money off this process, keeping it closed. And how do we find a balance there? Maybe in a more specific example of a Canadian context that we've seen a massive shift in how a research group and a community has changed how they do their research the Montreal Neurological Institute is, is one of those. So they were extremely frustrated by how slowly their results were translating into treatments. And they felt like all the work they were doing was done around the idea that they were going to get more funding for it rather, and pursuing patents rather than actually doing good research. And so the entire institute, which comprised more than 600 faculty and staff members, agreed that everything they did would be open and accessible to anyone. So their research methods, their approach, all of this was shared widely and made available. And because of that, they've seen better results. They've had more collaborations with other people and it's created a really dynamic shift in how their work is done and how they do so. And so it's a one positive example of what we're seeing here. And I think on the other side of this is what we're trying to see, what we're seeing in Canada more generally is that the government is thinking about how can we make publicly funded research more open? So again, not just our publication, but other pieces of information. And how do we make sure that you get credit for that at the grant stage, at the hiring process stage, at the tenure process stage? All of these things are trying to be considered and it's problematic because research has been done the same way for so long. And so what I wanna do for the rest of the session here is to show you where you can start with open scholarship and you can decide as an attendee today, whether or not it's something that you think you would pursue or not. And we can talk about that at the end of the session. And so if you're interested in open scholarship, you can ask yourself at the beginning of the process, how can I share what I'm doing with others at the very beginning? Can I hold myself accountable for the project plan? So one of the ideas of open scholarship generally is accountability, right? If I share my research protocol and my data analysis plan right away, it makes me accountable to follow that up. We see a lot of instances of things like p-hacking or hypothesis testing where people run the same experiment until they get a positive result. This way it changes that to show that you're not introducing any bias in your process. Again, we wanna think about understandability and the fact that our, our research is transparent and making it accessible to other people. So when we think about the life cycle here and all these different phases, what I wanna do is show you one thing you can do at every stage of the process, and you can decide again, whether or not this is something you wanna do. Now, the first example of this is pre-registration. So before your project even begins, you write up what your project is going to be, 
who you're going to collect data from and what the process looks like, and you publish that online that, so that it's available. So the idea around this before you share is it's going to eliminate bias and again, create accountability, as I said. It establishes the initial phase of the reproducibility process. It allows others to identify research that's being done on this topic so you're not competing with each other. And potentially it actually opens up a chance for collaboration and it gives you a chance to receive feedback from your peers. And so one way that you can do that is through a tool called OSF pre-registration. And this tool will allow you to share your information online. You publish a, your pre-registration of your study and it describes what you're planning to do. And by doing so, it releases it into the wild. It's citable, people can see it and they get a sense of the research that you're working on. And by doing so that you can get credit for it. And this isn't a new idea. If anyone has ever done a systematic review before, Everyone who conducts a systematic review is required to register that review um, in this database called Prospero. So what this does is allow people to not reinvent the wheel and create redundancy in research. And it allows people to see what ongoing results are already happening. And there's never been an issue in this environment where there's scooping or risk of theft in this case. So Farzana just asked a great question. Well, what about a scoping review or realist review? A lot of people are going to be are using a tool called the Open Science Framework, which is what the pre-registration page is done for, um, which I will show you a little bit later and provide you links to so you can see what's available. But many people are sharing pre-registrations of their scoping reviews and realist reviews as well. So the next stage is a little bit more uh, of a challenge for people, but it's something that we're starting to see more often. And this is the sharing of your methods of any instruments you create when that's possible. And so by doing so, what it does is it allows people to see how you are actually conducting your research. And again, eliminates bias because people can see the data collection instruments you're actually going to use. It also allows other people to use and cite the work that you do. It has an opportunity to gain feedback again, and it provides an opportunity for you to make your research understandable to others. And so one of the main platforms where this is being used right now is a tool called protocols.io. And I'm gonna share it here in the chat with you so you can all take a look at it. But what it is, is a place where researchers are sharing all aspects of your research. So here you actually have examples of protocols for entering labs post COVID-19 shutdown. But you can use this tool to look for any types of instruments or protocols or steps that you might be able to use for your own research that people are sharing and getting credit for as we speak. Farzana, your question about a scoping review already started, is it acceptable to do a pre-registration? Probably not, but I think an alternative could be you could share your study protocol at least. It wouldn't be a pre-registration because you've already started, but people would still be able to see that you're doing it and, and have it be available. And I think that would be perfectly acceptable. So tools like Protocol IO here are really designed to help you find and reuse and not reinvent the wheel. And that's all a product of open scholarship. Similarly, if you're looking for specific data collection instruments, uh, there is a tool called REDCap that our, our institution actually hosts, which allows you to see all the different types of data collection instruments people use in clinical studies. So I'm gonna share that link here. And so what it allows you to do is search for different topics or different conditions, and you could actually reuse these instruments for your own research. So whether that's a demographics form, or maybe you're studying depression and you're looking for specific surveys to help you assess that, REDCap actually provides these tools and allows you to embed them in your own research products. So a, a really great way for you, again, to not have to create an instrument from scratch, but to work for it going forward. So once we have the idea of data collection, this is also where the data management plan comes into play. So describing your data so other people can actually understand what it is you're collecting. It's obviously there to help people understand it, to make it reusable, and again, to provide a complete picture of your research product. And so one thing you can share, for example, is your data management plan that we talked about yesterday. This is something that provides a lot of context into your research and would help people understand it more broadly. 
Other people provide full examples of data collection plans. So the open science framework that I talked about before, here's an example of a group from Arizona State University who has shared their data collection plan publicly, at which can be cited and accessed very easily um, without any restrictions. So you can see their paper, you can look, link through to the data collection plan, and you can see all that information freely available online. If we move to the analysis stage of this process, you can be transparent about what you are doing with your plan and how you're doing so. So data analysis is an area of a lot of contention because people often will criticize how you might analyze something or the, the techniques you choose to analyze data. And so what this would do is help hold you accountable for how you would do so. It would also eliminate the risk that you'd be manipulating your data, uh, which I think most people wouldn't think of, but it shows the transparency level of what you're trying to do. It provides clear instructions to a user about how you transformed your data and what tools you use. And it also gives people a chance to share software programs or code or techniques that they might have used in the past. And so again, the idea here is that you're being very open about your procedures and how you got to your final results. And so again, I provide you an example from the Open Science Framework that shows an example of a data analysis plan somebody shared, and they've created a table of contents here that goes over every step they took in the analysis of their data from step by step. And I will be sharing these slides after the session, so don't worry about um, copying the links down. I'll make sure everybody has this at the end of the session. If you've never created an analysis plan before, I highly recommend this article. It's a really great way to break down the types of information that you would include in a data analysis plan. Everything from the software you've chosen to including information about the sample size and who you're collecting data from. And then finally, we get to the last stage, which is actually sharing the publication or the data or the final tools that you might have created in your study. And the idea here is that others can then see the full breadth of your research. Your research will actually be reproducible because they'll be able to access all the research you did over every stage, and it would be accessible to everybody. So one of the ways we've seen a lot of this happen, <clears throat> so that's, I'll, I'll, I'll get to your question there in a second, Michelle, once I finish my, my session here. So actually, yeah, let's let's pause and see what the questions are. So if you published a plan to conduct a scoping review in OSF and things changed after you finished the review, is it okay to change it? Yes, it is. I think one of the great things about the open science framework, which I'll share with you, is that you can update your plan. I think what people often fear, right, and we all should know this being interested in research in some way, research is fluid and changes. And so we need to be flexible. But what's important is that whatever is publicly available and, and viewable and accessible to somebody, we need to make sure that changes we make on the back end are reflected in that. So again, we're keeping that level of transparency going throughout the process. So absolutely, you can go and change your protocol because your research changed. And no one's going to fault you for that. It's just the fact that something happened and you changed. And you can even document what that change was in that review. So I'm looking at Farzana's question. So a research team shared their analysis plan and being community-based participatory research, they had to modify the plan as they go. So in this case, what you would do is obviously community-based research is incredibly important here. And I'll, I'll get to that too, where you're only going to make things open if you're working within community confines, that's acceptable. But I, again, I think it's important to note that you can make changes to anything you make open. It's just important that people see the progression of those stages. And so what Open Science Framework does is actually allow you to see the first version you did and then how it changed with version two and version three and so on. So that's a possibility. So it's not, you're not stuck in the confines of what you said you're going to do, but it's just important to think about keeping it open and updated throughout that process. Good questions, everybody. Thank you for sharing those. So one of the things we're seeing on the publication side that's becoming incredibly prominent is sharing preprints, right? So preprints of our research before they're published Many journals uh, permit and accept and are perfectly fine 
with the idea of you sharing a preprint so that it can be openly available and readable to others. And so this link provides you with a wide variety of the different kinds of preprint servers available who will accept publishing preprints for you. And we know that there's been a massive preprint boom since COVID because ideally people wanted their research to be findable right away. And I have known some people who are so extreme in the sense that they don't want to give their money to publishers or they don't want to have publishers charge for their fees. So they exclusively only publish in preprints. And then they record the peer review they get back from the community itself as, as a strong stance against it. So we're seeing people again on the spectrum of their levels of openness and, and willingness to do so. When it comes to publishing, we are always going to recommend you choosing an open access journal, fully acknowledging that some of them will provide will require fees associated with them and sometimes exorbitant fees. But the more open your, your publications are, the higher the citations rates are, the more exposure you get for your work. The actual public funding of their research is made available. And so we always try to encourage open access and many of which are free. And to do so, if you want to look for an open access journal, there's the, the uh, directory of open access journals where you can find any journal and limit to those that are freely available. We also know that as the years are progressing, we're seeing a massive trend towards people moving towards open publishing more broadly. And so the idea of the gray here on this slide is that closed research is shrinking more and more because people want their research to be more discoverable and more available. We also are seeing the trend towards sharing the data underlying our publications. So anyone who attended the data management session yesterday knows that the actual information, that there are tools available for you to share your research data more broadly. And so the Federated Research Data Repository in Canada is our main disciplinary open research repository where you can share your research data, link it to your publication, and link it to any other research products that you might share online. Now, as we think about this, I want to again emphasize that not everything that we work on, especially as I'm assuming many of you are from the health sciences, can be made open. So before you enter into any idea of sharing your research online, the focus should be, can I share these pieces of information responsibly? Do I have permission from the community members I'm working with on my study? Do I have consent from the participants I'm working with to share these different aspects of my research online? And so you always want to be cognizant of the fact that openness is also tied to who you're collecting data from. And so before you make things open, there are some things you can do in order to make sure that you're doing so responsibly. So the main tool that I think is valuable for you to consider as an open research product is the open science framework. So I'm going to share that link here now. And yes, for example, the slides will be shared afterwards. So this is a place where you can share all the aspects of your research in one place. So whether it's a pre-registration, it's your research products, it's your data sets, so it's a preprint, it really provides you with all of those things in one place. And so just to show that I'm not somebody who teaches this class and doesn't practice what they preach, this is an example of my own research. And I'm gonna share this as well so you can see it. So I pre-registered my study at the very beginning of the, of the project, I got feedback from that project and even found a collaborator from doing so at the pre-registration stage. I then shared all the different products of my research online. So my methodology, my data analysis plan, my data sets, all of that was shared on the Open Science Framework in the center. And then before I published, I published a preprint. At the same time, I submitted my article to a journal. Or, sorry, my, yeah. And then finally, after that, it was published in CMAJ Open. And all of these are linked together. So when you're at my preprint, you can see the, the final journal product, or you could link back to the research product online or the pre-registration. And so the idea now is that someone could look at my paper and see every facet of my research from start to finish and all the different things I did over the course of that project. And that's really sort of the ethos of what open scholarship would look like in a best case scenario. So in my case, I had, a, I had great success with 
opening my research early because I got great feedback from colleagues. I also found a collaborator to help me with the project in the first place by doing it this way. So it's obviously an ideal outcome and nobody sat and criticized my data set necessarily, but we're more just thankful that that research was available. So that's not going to be the case all the time, but in this case, I consider myself fortunate that that's what's been happening and I continue to commit to doing so this way. Again, the other benefit to using a tool like this is that all of it requires citation, right? So anybody who uses a data set, it's published online and it really facilitates the idea of citing your research. So whether they're going to access my methods or my raw data, it's citable and it's included in this tool and available. So that if somebody was to use it in, like in a way that was not necessarily appropriate, I could point back to this and say, this is available and this is mine, and here's proof. So that's one of the parts too, right? I'm not saying doing this out of the goodness of your heart, which is one part of it, but you also want to get credit for all the hard work you did. And so that's why it's important to balance these two things. Any questions or comments at this point about that process? Feel free to explore those links and take a look around. And I'll also be sharing at the end some resources for videos to get up to speed with Open Science Framework as well. I'm just going to pause for a second. Okay, so let's move towards a bit of a wrap up here, and then we can get into some discussion. So the final idea here, right, is that open scholarship is a chance for you to share something about every aspect of your research process or the research life cycle. So these are some simple ways, even though it might take some work on your part, it actually creates a lot of openness and availability. And what I have found is by making my research open, as I mentioned yesterday in the data management class, it makes writing the paper so much easier because all of that has already been done in a way where I've been really thoughtful about what I publish publicly to make sure that it's of good quality. And then when it comes to write the paper at the end, it's a lot faster and, and more painless because of, because of it. So, and then to getting to a lot of your questions, like what Michelle and Farzana were asking in the chat, it's ongoing, right? So things are going to change and things are going to happen. And so updating those online is the best thing you can do to make sure that when people see and come across your research online, whether it be an instrument or your pre-registration, it lets them see the process that you're working through and being able to access that and, and have it be available to them. But I also want to stress, because I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, the onus is on me here, right? I have to do all the work. But the benefit to doing, if more people are practicing open scholarship, then data sets and instruments and code and software and preprints and research are also more available to you. So you, by proxy, have access to more research. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So the idea here is that if we're all sharing more openly and collaboratively, we're actually reducing workload, making it more efficient and finding stronger collaborations in which we can work with. So it's not all on you to share. There are benefits to everyone practicing open scholarship in the same way. So if you are interested in committing to open science or open scholarship in some way, there are actual agreements that people have, have been creating so that before you start a project, you sit down with your, co your colleagues or with a community and you say, here are some of the considerations we wanna follow. And I'll share this in the slides as well. And it's a commitment that you make as a part of a research team to make research open. And again, this doesn't have to be everything I talked about today. It can be one piece or a couple pieces. But the idea is that you're thinking about transparency and openness so that the people you work with and potentially the actual communities that you work with will be able to see transparently what's available and what's being done with their research. So there's an equity aspect to this as well. So I highly encourage you to look through this. It's, it's created by a few of my colleagues who work at UCSF and Stanford. And I found it to be a great tool for myself when starting up a new project with collaborators. So I want to wrap up with really a discussion or a takeaway um, but before I do that, I just want to highlight that there are three other sessions in the series. So 
the idea of reducing author fees and open access publishing is tomorrow. If you're concerned about predatory publishing or journals, um, that will be Thursday. And then our library has its own institutional repository where you can share research for free, like I talked about today. And that's going to be on Friday. So I highly encourage you to go to that as well. And there's all the resources here, which I'll share with you as you go through. Um, you're welcome to use any of these for work that you have, including any links on the slide. But I want to close with a discussion or potential takeaway that you may have, which is, would you consider making parts or all of your research process open and publicly available? Why or why not? And I don't think there's necessarily a wrong or right answer, but I'll stop now and I'm happy to answer questions or have a discussion. And I'm also gonna stop the recording. So with that, I'll thank everybody and we'll have a discussion here or you're welcome to, to move on with your day. So let me stop here.